staff in fire weather and indices. And Aaron Stacey will be presenting. He's with the, he's the fire science and planning specialist in the aviation, forest fire, and emergency services of Ontario. And then I'm going to let Aaron continue his introduction because he does have a slide. Okay. So with that, go ahead. Take it away, Aaron. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to Jack and the Lake States Fire Science Consortium for this uh, opportunity for me to be able to speak with you. And uh, thank you for everyone that's attending. Um, I'm here to talk to you about Weather Shield, as Jack mentioned. It wouldn't be a if we didn't have an acronym, um, and Weather Shield is no exception. Uh, Weather Shield stands for Weather, Short, Intermediate, and Long-Term Dynamic Ensemble Scenarios. And I will apologize if there's any delay in terms of slide transitions, but just bear with us as it goes through. So I wanted to start with who I am. My name is Aaron Stacey, and I'm the Fire Science and Planning Specialist with the Aviation, Forest, Fire, and Emergency Services Branch of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in Ontario. I uh, have a Master's in Environmental Studies and a Bachelor's Degree in Computer Science. I'm also on the Advisory Board, uh, I'm advisory board member for the Lake State Fire Science Consortium. It was during a previous webinar that Weather Shield came up in conversation, and uh, I spoke with Jack about trying to put a presentation together, and it ended up with today being the day. It, uh, I guess it was, I can speak to Jack, I think it was almost four or five months ago that we talked about it, so I'm glad to be able to get this opportunity now. Uh, in terms of the agenda, I'm going to start with um, kind of the beginnings of Weathershield, uh, what it became, and the next steps for Weathershield. Uh, there are probably some people on this call that have actually seen presentations, probably hosted by Colin McFadden or others, that have spoken or talked about the, um, the formation of Weather Shield. And I'm not going to go into the, the detail that some of those presentations went into, but I'm going to try to expand on where it's going and what we're trying to use it for now. So the reason for Weather Shield was uh, it's kind of here in this example here. This is an example of a probabilistic fire growth model. Uh, the model consists of many different simulations that attempt to give the user an idea of the areas most likely to burn. In this case, the bright red areas would indicate the locations that, that burned in many different scenarios, whereas the light yellow would be areas where few fires burned to. This map is a departure from the current systems used in Ontario that, that are using in that we are using multiple simulations to help determine areas we need to focus on when a fire occurs. So instead of doing a, a, sim, uh, a single growth model, we're doing, in this case, thousands of them to, to overlay them to find out the likelihood of an area burning. In the beginning, we had this concept, but we needed to develop a means of introducing variability into the different scenarios. After many brainstorming sessions, we were looking at weather ensembles like the North American Ensemble Forecast System, or NAEFS, another acronym. This provided us with coverage for 15 days of predictions, which was composed of 42 scenarios. This wasn't enough, and it wasn't long enough. How do we develop something that looks long term? This is important when you look at the fire season. As you can, I'm highlighting here, we in, in Ontario, our fire season is from the beginning of Oct um, April to the end of October. It is possible for a fire to burn for months. We would like to get an idea early on for those fires that, and how they may behave, and a 15-day forecast just wouldn't cover that. As luck would have it, as we were working on the system, Jerry Shields, um, note the last name and the connection to Weather Shield, uh, the Weather Systems Coordinator here with Aviation, Forest Fire, and Emergency Services. He was experimenting with different ways of looking, uh, looking at the fire season. What he ended up with was a system designed to look at weather based on ocean patterns as a means of predicting weather. Jerry was using this and validating it on his own and finding positive results. At the same time, we were working on a project to create the probabilistic fire growth model. We were working on ways of incorporating variability into the model, and one way was through weather. I lost my sign. Uh, um, incorporating the long-term weather that we were hoping to use was the ideal situation coming from Jerry. So we wanted to 
figure out how we could break down the multiple multiple time periods, the short, the long, and the, the short, the intermediate, and the long term. In terms of short term, uh, numerical models alone are not a perfect solution. Uh, the Weather Office in Ontario provides a short term weather prediction that outperforms uh, most of the models that are out there. They created deterministic forecasts by examining weather observations, outputs from weather models, and use their own knowledge and experience to produce a prediction for five days out. This produces one scenario. All right, hey, come on, relax. Uh, at a 20 kilometer grid intersect resolution. So as you can see here, this is one of the predictions. Just pull the panel from the past, um, and it's giving it a general idea as to what the weather is for those five days. When looking at intermediate, as I've previously mentioned, the NAEFS ensemble consists of 42 scenarios and one degree solution resolution. These scenarios are created by changing initial conditions and model parameters. So that got us to the 15 days, and then if we wanted to extend that, um, the final time period is the long-term time period. There is a, very, a variety of models that are out there for calculating the seasonal and monthly forecasts. Some of you may know of, of systems that use climate, climatological approaches, such as historic climate data, or other, others use random sampling to create synthetic weather scenarios. Weather, you use, weather Shield uses something different for prediction of long-term forecasting. Ocean temperature patterns are known to influence weather. Weather, as we know, is vital to understanding a given fire, fire's behavior. Jerry Shields developed a method for seasonal forecasting which incorporates El Nino Southern Oscillation, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. As you can tell, I'm not a weather expert. Uh, the method, the re method and the relationship of sea surface temperatures, the method was the relationship of the sea surface temperatures and associated weather. The assumption is that similar ocean patterns will result in similar weather. The method was adapted and incorporated into Weather Shield, where we take the, ma the month and the year matches and rank a single set of historic years to order in order of best. So essentially, this is, this is our, our matching algorithm. You forecast the ocean temperature, you match a you match based on a score of the ocean temperatures with the past uh, to the use the past sorry weather to match the, the current and upcoming expected trends. Rank the years according to representations. Select the appropriate number of years. You want to capture the single and not lose the, the variability. So that would mean in terms of, of looking at this, you don't want to be capturing too many years because you don't want to be approaching climatology, which would basically be an average. You want to be capturing the similar years. And then you probably you probably use probability to weight the years based on the scores. So here's um, an example of us selecting years in one of our models. If you include too many, you're approaching climatology. Include too few years, and there's not enough variability. You're selected based on the sum of the, the score to a specific target, the probability waiting for each year is derived from the year score. So I need to jump back here. Hopefully you can see the, the arrow there. We're looking at a, the scores here along the left-hand side. And as you progress down, there's less years that match up. And we're trying to catch the years that match up best. And I'm going to turn that off now. So what we end up with after all that is an ensemble, is an ensemble as above. Um, we have the Aviation Forest Fire and Emergency Services forecast. We have the ensemble forecast from NAEFS. Finally, we have a long-term weather scenario selected as outlined earlier based on similar ocean temperatures. One thing that I should point out is here is that an additional step we took was to merge the scenarios. As you can see, the NAEFS data end 
It is the starting point for the matching of historic years. This isn't a big deal when you're looking at something like temperature, but when you're talking about fire weather indices, this means we're taking a current scenario and applying historic weather scenarios. This means there's kind of a memory built into the system for longer term indices. We don't just start with historic scenarios because they could be a good match going forward, but they may have different weather patterns that are happening in the, in the days we're matching up. Um, so what is Weather Shield? As the previous slide highlighted, visualizing weather can provide a better understanding than looking at a spreadsheet full of numbers. Weather Shield was intended to be a part of a fire growth model, but it was decided that we needed to present the weather as a means of getting acceptance from the field. This is how the web tool came to be. So this is a uh, little screenshot on the right is, is the, the active website right now. The tool allows users to select a location, forecast duration, weather, fire weather indices from the FWI system. <clears throat> Although we built in startup rules following methods developed by the C uh, Canadian Forest Service, we also allow the user to manually control the startup of indices if they have information that may not be matching the system. For example, this could be if, the, if we've got snowfall and the, and, the, and the weather station isn't up to date. Unfortunately, due to some errors with our connection, um, I'm not able to give you a live run of, uh, of a real-time version of Weather Shield. So I took uh, so I took an example that I ran a couple of uh, weeks ago. And let's be honest, we are almost at the end of the fire season already, so there wasn't going to be too much of a, a weather trend to be looking at. For this run, I selected all the defaults uh, and also selected the option to download the scenarios to see what went into the data that, that is being displayed. So here's an example of the output from WeatherShield. Um, I know it is impossible to read for many of you. It's probably hard to read here. Uh, this can be exported as a, sorry, but I displayed it this way to show the amount of data that is available. This could be exported as a report to be included in other reports, or individual charts can be downloaded and printed. We intentionally left much of that to the user, as from the front end, as I mentioned earlier, you can filter down the data that you want to see and how they want to use the data afterwards. Temperature, relative humidity, accumulated precip, to date accumulated precip, forecast winds and wind rows are the weather data that can be seen and in itself is helpful for the decision maker. We may get a good idea of the dominant wind direction over the time period, period, giving us a general spread direction, or we might see a significant amount of rain in the forecast. In addition to all of this data, we have data from the FWI systems perhaps giving an idea of longer term trend, drying trends or other general fire behavior indicators. Finally, at the bottom, we have the, the years matching graph indicating the selected years that match best. If we zoom in a bit, we can take a look at temperature. The first graph shows the ensemble nature of the system. You can see the different areas I have referred to earlier, and I can just highlight them for those that might not. We have the ASFES predictions, and then we also have the, the NAEFS predictions running up to here. And then after that is the, the years matching based on the on ocean temperatures. Weather Shield's long-term prediction, as mentioned, is done using previous weather and combining it to the current situation. The second image has taken the scenarios above and brings them down to a confidence interval that are easier to read. This also includes climatology, min-max, and means. This is where weather shield is valuable in long-term prediction. We can look at the trend of the forecast against the climatological norms. In this example, the system is expecting the area to be colder than normal. You can see that, and hopefully it's clear for everyone, but the climatological mean is here, and we're expecting our norms to start are falling below that, so we'd be expecting a bit cooler than what would, would have been the norm. The 
Even if this is a historical view, we can look at the observed weather and see, and see the behavior. So I've included the observed weather here as well. In general, you can see the trend stayed true to the prediction. On September 16th, we can see the trend was going to be a bit warmer on that day. So if we look right here, we're seeing the line above the climatological norm, so we would be expecting it to be a bit warmer. Obviously, this isn't within the AFF yet. Uh, within the shorter term, so not looking at the pattern matching of the long term, but the idea is still the same. Um, on September 16th, we see the trend is going to be a bit warmer, and then actually on that day we had what looks to be uh, a matching max for the climatological, uh, the historic time within that region. Not long after this, though, we see that the trend starts to go below the climatological norm, and the observed follows suit. In the real world, we wouldn't be looking day to day, but at the, uh, but at the trend, especially if we go further out of prediction. So there's going to be variability in temperature, especially, um, but we are generally capturing that trend out uh, from the middle of September to the beginning of October. Here we see the number of years that were selected. Uh, five is a pretty solid number in terms of matching years. Uh, in terms of our model, three is the lowest possible for matching. We also see fairly good matches here, so we'd be pretty confident in the results. Um, in terms of a personal opinion, I know that this isn't the perfect way of doing things, but in the fire, in, in, within fire, we always look back at historical years and try to figure out where things line up. And in terms of fire weather, 1976 in Ontario was a, was a pretty intense year is one of the worst years for fires. You can see here that it's not a great match. This doesn't validate anything, but in terms of my gut feeling, I, I wanted to make sure that given that the September wasn't a bad September in terms of weather, uh, we didn't want it to be matching one of the worst years we had on record. So at least when I look at things, I'm almost always trying to look at years that I remember or I've heard about because this was before my time. I do want to touch on validation pretty quickly. Uh, we attempted a variety of validation techniques. Um, as you may know, validating weather can be very, very difficult, and there's no silver bullet that provides the answer. We have a large province with long, with, uh, and we're dealing with long-term weather. What measurement do you use? It's hard to say. When validating, do you get it wrong if we've missed the rain by one day on a 90-day prediction? Our previous methods for validation had looked at that, and though we were seeing some improvements over climatology, it didn't speak to the actual design of the original model. I have hundreds of these types of charts that show us doing well against climatology and random selections, and others where we don't do so well. Um, essentially what I wanted to get here is that we are, we are starting to look at the validation of the weather trends, not specifically the day-to-day -day weather. Um, the the method behind weather shield was uh, the long-term weather was not looking at, at specific days. We were looking at those trends, and that's what we're trying to validate now. This will take some time as we're in the design phase, but will hopefully allow us to check the models for how it was intended. We are expecting this to be, or, for example, are we expecting this to be a colder or hotter than normal year, wetter or drier? Do we need to worry about this fire, or can we leave it for a while? Um, we don't need to validate on day 73, we we're expecting rain or didn't get rain. We we're trying to track, catch those trends. Now, in terms of the future of Weather Shield, here's where it actually comes to play in terms of the fire behavior models. Um, I'm not sure how this is going to come up on your screen, but right about in the middle of the screen, we have day one of a fire. Um, in Nipigon. You can see the general location up in the top, top right here. Um, this model that's being run is, is called Firestar. It basically takes, it, it looks at our, our fire information system and grabs, it grabs the data every five, every five minutes looking for new fires that may start and basically runs this model uh, in the background. So it's not something that somebody has to sit there and wait for a fire to pop in to actively 
get it started. This is already happening in the background. So this fire was, was called in and it got it, it was put into the system so the fire ran in, within Firestar and using Weather Shield weather. So on day one it was there. You're not seeing much variability when we look, so I'm gonna, not gonna rush through it. Um, in day one, you're not seeing much variability. It's very difficult to see. We're kind of, it's, it's not a large fire in the first place. Um, but as we start progressing through the days, we will start seeing the variability as to where we're expecting this fire to occur, or, or most likely to, to burn. We're starting to see a little bit of a red area in here. And as, a, as someone who's analyzing this, I would be expecting the fire to be somewhere in that general area. That, and that's not actually true. What you'd be expecting is if a fire was to occur, those cells would be more likely to burn. It's not going to be a per the perimeter of the fire, it's just measuring the likelihood of each cell burning. We progress to day three, and we're starting to see more scenarios spread out, where we're still seeing a core of scenarios in, in this general area. And finally, on day seven, we have the extent to where we could have predicted it to go, and we also have the actual perimeter of the fire here. Just moving the arrow out of the way. So as you can see, we're seeing most of the areas that were selected that, that actually were burned were in our high probability areas for the fire. Here's another example. Uh, again, this is up to the northern part of the province. On day one, we have the fire here. It's not, not predicting to be very large. By day two, it's expanding, and we have, again, the probability where it's going to be. By day three, we saw a bit of a jump from day, day two. By day seven, it's continuing to grow, and we have some pretty darkening red areas here. Then going out to day 14, um, which is as far as Firestar goes right now. This is the actual perimeter of the fire. And again, we have a lot of the areas that were actually burned were in those areas that we were expecting to burn based on, based on the number of simulations that we ran. In terms of the placement of Weather Shield, it's, it's one component of a variety of systems that we're working on. So weather shield up here at the top is creating the probabilistic fire weather that feeds into the fire star, which is doing a burn probability. The next steps are looking at how we're going to analyze the impacts of that fire, so looking at the different assets and resources that are out that are that are out on the landscape that could potentially be impacted. That the, the probability and and the expected impacts lead to the risk of that fire. And then finally, the cost of the suppression that could be expected for those fires will be all part of FireGuard when that, when that model is completed. I'm clearly not the only person who will be working on the project. And the problem, as you can see, I'm not even near the top of that list. But there's a variety of people that worked on this project. Um, Colin McFadden, many of you have probably met or seen presentations by already, but we he's been involved with the project from the beginning. Um, we have the development team, and then we also have academic uh, calibration from a uh, collaboration from uh, the University of Ontario as well as the University of, uh, University of Western Ontario and the University of Toronto, as well as uh, Mike Flanagan from University of Alberta helping with the weather forecasting. That takes us to where we are right now with Weather Shield. Um, I had put the, I'd maximized my window so I haven't seen if there's been any questions. Um, and just wanted to know if you had any questions, if Jack can move some of those forward if we have them. Yeah, so if folks have questions, please type them in the chat box. Um, I think we had just a comment. Uh, BJ Glesner said that where, I'm not even sure which slide it was, but it was consistent for the period in the Western Great Lakes. And then there was a question about the, uh, if they're 10K grids or not. Yeah, and those would be 10K grids. They're the, uh, 
a universe transmutator grid, so UTM. So each of those is an individual, uh, an individual grid that's broken down. And when you look at it in, the, in terms of the GIS side of things, it's possible to provide a, a zone as well as this ID, and you can track right down to that cell. All right. Um, and then we have Joel Curtis, who said, looks promising, likes the way that it brings in costs for triage in an outbreak. We'll give folks here some time to uh, type in some questions. Yeah, if there's any um, highly detailed questions, I can definitely bring them forward to the to the working group as well, um, or the development team and anybody if there's anything that I can't answer. We have some folks typing, so we'll give it a few minutes here. And here, and I'm going to move down to your question slide, I believe. That way, too, there's Aaron's contact information. So if you have questions later, you can uh, email Aaron. Okay. All right. Uh, Keith Murphy asks, where do you get your fuel data from? Um, I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to actually have to confirm that. I know that we've done a lot of analysis uh, Canada-wide in terms of our fuel layer. And we've been doing some validation on that, so I can I can confirm that for Keith. All right. And let's see, Brian Potter asked, beyond the ensemble period, where do you get the wind direction speed for the scenarios? Um, that weather that's going to be coming from the the different ensembles that we use. So the NAEFS is going to be providing that information for us. Um, it's basically something we. We take from the different scenarios of what they're expected, uh, with their, their expected weather, and we incorporate that into our. All right. Sorry, I'm just making notes to see if I can track down any of the other, if there's any other questions. Oh, sure. Yeah, we'll give it a few more. Um, just see if there's any other questions people can. Type in. And feel free to reach me out, uh, reach out to me in, uh, via email as well. Yeah, let's see, while we're waiting to see if there's any more questions <clears throat> to come in, um, just a reminder that this webinar is recorded, and I'll be getting a copy of it up on our website Make sure I also share it with the uh, North Atlantic and Alaska Fire Science uh, Consortium so that they have the link to that recording. Um, we'll also save this as a PDF on the, the website, so you don't necessarily have to go through the whole recording if you were looking for just a specific slide, too. Okay. And not seeing any other questions, I guess we will Go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I'm going to. Oh, sorry, I flip this red oh. Ryan question. Oh, okay, and we do have some more people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. <and laughs> Brian, what I wanted, I guess, beyond the ensemble period, we um, we are using the historic weather, uh, so that's going to be the the I guess the historic matching weather. So we're going to be ex we're going to be expecting similar weather patterns. Obviously, it's not going to uh, things aren't going to work out the exact same every year. Um, last year is not going to be the same as this year, but it's using the best case scenario for that. All right, looks like Brian was typing. <laughs> if he has an additional follow-up question or that works for him. I'm going to go ahead and just move to the last slide while we're waiting to see if we have any additional questions. Um, it's just to highlight uh, the next webinar, um, which we have in November. It's November 29th. Um, 
So in sharp tailed grouse reintroduction at Muckle Barrens. And Muckle Barrens is a large landscape scale site on the Schwamig and Nicolay National Forest in the northwest portion of Wisconsin. Um, so they've been doing some pretty active fire uh, work there and just recently did some reintroduction of sharp tailed grouse too. All right, we do have additional questions here. One from Brian Potter. Thanks, Aaron. And he wondered if after you showed your second scenario where it looked like the winds pushed the firewall to the firewall to the northeast. And he's gonna follow up with an email. <laughs> and Travis, currently the website is not uh, publicly accessible. It's all within our intranet. Some folks typing away, so let's just give a few more minutes and see. And Aaron, you're able to see the messages now, right? The yep. chat messages. Yep. Yeah, I, I zoom back out. That's fine. Yeah, Colin's actually attended the presentation, so you can see the the examples that I gave of the fire growth models are all from the NAEF, NAEFS. We're not using the historic weather for the um, uh, for the fire star yet. Okay. And just to confirm with Travis, the website's not publicly accessible right now. It's all within the Ontario intranet. Okay, let's copy. Somebody else typing, so let's see if there's an additional question or And then BJ Klesner said the the grids that cover Ontario do cover the lake states. Oh yeah? Right. And we have some additional typing. <laughs> yes. One big problem, yes. All right. Well, Aaron, um, we'll watch and see if there's any additional questions. Why don't we wrap this up? I'm going to move the chat box up there. Again, the direct link to the webinar page, which is archived, and that will have um, again, the recording in PDF, and also has Aaron's contact information. Um, and thanks, Aaron, for everyone. That. And yes, I, and Aaron, thank you so much um, for, for doing this for us, and thanks for everybody for uh, participating today. So hopefully we'll see you at the uh, uh, November webinar or another webinar. With that, we'll wrap this up. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, guys.